أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مد حته القاعلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المستحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وأحل بيته الطيبين الطاحرين المعسومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العس والزمان خليفة الرحمن ما ملنس والجان ولعن الله أعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تكونوا كالذين نص الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد <تصفيق> Our discussion has been revolving around the levels of akhlaq and the attempt now for the past four nights has been to look at akhlaq through the lens of our worship. To find this ideal behavior that Allah is asking us now to attain through our worship. And it's a tough topic to uh, discuss over four nights. I am thankful to the Masameen community and committee and the team for including me as one of this year's speakers. It's always a pleasure to be here. As you know, I call all of you my home in the West, alhamdulillah. So it was nice to be amongst family in this beautiful month. Uh, usually I travel, but this year I chose not to. And it's, it's the first time I think in many, many years I'm addressing you all in the month of Ramadan. May Allah accept your amal. May the rest of your Ramadan go very well, inshallah. And please include us in your du'as and in the nights of Qadr. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. <coughs> we were able to get to the first level, and that first level is when the Qur'an invites us to understand ourselves, our capacity, our tendencies, our limitations, our innate nature. Unless we understand who we're dealing with, meaning ourselves, behavior and worship and what our purpose is, might become a unattainable goal. And so for the past two nights now, we've been looking at the idea of what are the various dimensions inside of us that help us achieve this level of behavior. Because the premise, if you remember all the way back now four nights ago, we talked about the idea that through the worship, we should now be, uh, be cleansing our behavior. We should be better human beings. <clears throat> And last night, I talked about the idea that sometimes our behavior is justified through our lens with the idea that it's part of my innate nature, Malana. It's just simply who I am. I can't change who I am. I, I, you know, I have tendencies towards being somebody who is angry, outspoken, or I have tendencies towards being somebody who's quiet. I don't really like to ruffle feathers. I'm not confrontational, for example. I'm soft-spoken. I'm, I'm not very soft-spoken. All these things now we kind of equate to our innate nature and we assume that that's written in stone. It's not changeable. And that's why Ayatollah Naraqi in his book, Ja'mi al-Sadat, in the beginning of that discussion of akhlaq, when he defines akhlaq very beautifully, he talks about the idea that three essential um, components make up our behavior. One is no doubt our, our innate nature. I mentioned last night that Imam Khomeini in his chair hadith talks about the fact that the hadith says that sometimes our behavior is written for us in the womb of our mothers. <clears throat> but that's only one part of it. 
The other two parts are the ones where he focuses on. One, of course, is habit. We develop a certain behavior. And the final one where he really places the attention on is the idea that through practice and tamreen and repetition, we're able now to kind of sculpt our behavior to, of course, reflect that of what the deen wants. Remember my zebra example from yesterday. A lot of us now don't like to be that, you know, that that factor where we stand out in our behavior. So if society is going towards one area, destructive or not, we're gonna go through the area just because we don't want to be that person that the spotlight is on. <clears throat> and that brings me to today. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Sorry. And, and that is the idea that sometimes I think we believe that we have a certain respect that we have to attain in our life, especially as men. We believe that if I show power, and sometimes that power comes at the cost of someone else's respect, be it as a husband or a father, you know, I want to make sure that I am the wali inside of the house. So I think I have to act a certain way inside of, the, of that house to attain that power. If I don't have that respect inside of my home, I won't have respect outside of my home. So we end up now talking about the idea that, look, I want to make sure that I am the one who is victorious in this battle, be it the battle with my wife or with my kids or with the community or whatever the case may be, right? So I will now adopt a behavior that, that, that's destructive as long as the respect I have is there. A common, common complaint I get from men nowadays is, Mulana, I don't have respect inside my home. My wife, my children, nobody respects me. And we think that just by being a male, that respect is given. And yes, in terms of cliche, absolutely. Being a father and a husband, sometimes that title alone will invoke some respect to a certain level. But the respect that you and I want as the wali inside the house is something else. So that means we have to search for our respect and our validation somewhere else so that we are something else inside the home. Let me explain. Again, I go back to these classical texts of our ulama and our Adab al-Salat of Imam Khomeini rahmatullah alayhi, in the beginning of that book, 17 chapters he talks about the adab of the qalb first. The etiquette of the heart. In 17 chapters, before even wudu and tahara and ruku and sujood, 17 jami, mufassil, complete discussions on the heart. There's no point in you attempting or I attempting now to uphold the etiquette of Salat if our heart is not ready. In that, he talks about the idea that we should aspire to be a level, to a level where we're able to now reach a level where ظاهرك لفنا وباطنك أنا Please follow me very carefully. I don't have much time. He says where the outside of you your zahir, your apparent, the exoteric life of yours, this dunya essentially, lifana is perishing. It's annihilation in front of you. Kullu man alayha fan, Surah Rahman says. Everything will perish. What is baqi, of course, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why he says it should be where you look at things outside of you, in the kharij world, as fana, as perishing. That you take from what you want and you leave it. You don't attach yourself to it. You don't climb onto a sinking ship. No one does it. As a ship goes down, the passengers jump off. No one jumps on the Titanic. People try to jump off the Titanic. If we really truly see that ship as sinking. And once that happens, once you identify the perishing nature of those things outside of you, human nature says, I'm looking for the eternal. The eternal, he says, batinuka, is inside of you. That's what he says, ana. Ana meaning what? Not me, as a Jaffrey. God says, I should be found inside of you. So where there is perishing outside of you, there is eternity inside of you. Provided, that's a very... That's the ideal, right? That's where we're after in this world. That somehow in, this, in these distractions, we find God. And we find God where? Inside of our hearts. Al-qalbu haram Allah, fala tuskin. Haram Allah, ghayr Allah, Imam Salih says. The heart is the sanctuary of Allah. And do not allow anything to reside in that haram except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to make sure that we attain that. 
Which means that in this worship now, what this worship that Allah, this fiqh, this jurisprudence is trying to do is destroy those things that we think are baqi inside of us. And drown ourselves in the true eternal being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where now my eternal, or sorry, my external is perishing, my internal is eternal. Provided I look at worship the appropriate way. And I find my respect in my worship. Let me give you a couple examples. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad please. A few examples. And these are things that all of you, mashallah, have performed. The monastic of Hajj. If you examine the monastic of Hajj, every item in the monastic of Hajj, every stop, every worship, has a beautiful botany and, and esoteric dimension to it. The example I'll give you, and I'll give you my own example. To me, the peak of sort of the nothingness and that's what we want. We want to make sure that we attain a level of nothingness in worship. And again, I'll explain what that means in a moment. Where now, one would assume that when you arrive in Mecca, you right away start doing tawaf, sa'i, this and that, and your hajj now starts inside Mecca. The hajj doesn't start in Mecca. <laughs> God says, not yet. You're not ready. Your heart isn't ready. You've come from your corners of, of, of the world. You've brought your dunya with you. You've brought your, your, your heart with you. I have to make sure I cleanse that heart. And then you come and you enter my sanctuary, meaning, meaning the Kaaba, my bait, making sure that you come in a cleansed state. So first thing before even the tawaf of Hajj is done in, 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 in Mecca, Allah says, go to Arafah. Go, leave Mecca. Go to Arafah. Spend an afternoon in Arafah. There's no golden arches, there's no Dubai Mall in Arafah, it's mountains. That's it. You are there with two towels on as males, and we are there amongst mountains. If you're lucky, you have a little bit of a mattress to lie on, otherwise it's you, the tent, the ground, and the mountains. That's it, for one afternoon. And then you reach Muzdalafa. Oh, Muzdalafa. That's when I realized what Hajj was, for me personally. Muzdalafa, I still have images of myself in Muzdalafa. If you have not been in Hajj, Muzdalafa is where you are nothing. That's where it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how many zeros in your account, doesn't matter what car you drive, square footage, nothing. At that moment, we're all equal. We're all on the ground looking for rocks for Mina. Muzdalafa is a place, open field, barely a bathroom, garbage on the ground, uneven ground, and there's rocks everywhere. And you're asked as males to spend one night in Muzdalafa. On a, if you're lucky, on a very thin mattress. I'll never forget that moment. We were given a small little bag to fill our rocks for Mina. So imagine now, picture this for a moment now. These are grown men now. We had 250 people in our group from the UK, from America, and from Toronto. And I am there in my two towels. And beside me, I know, is a millionaire. A millionaire beside me. And he and I together on, our, on the ground, on all fours, scratching the ground, looking for rocks. Putting the rock that we think is good enough inside of our little small little bag. So I'm collecting rocks. And then I sit on my mattress, counting my rocks. Comparing the sizes. Big enough, short enough, small enough, flat enough, not good, yes good, blah, blah, blah. At that, at, that, at that moment, I realized what God wanted me to do. He wanted me to end back and enter back into Mecca now. Where what, what have you done now? You have spent the night in Muzdalafa. You've walked to Mina. You've thrown the, the rocks at Shaitan. You've done all of that internal cleansing. Now enter my baits. Now come back to Mecca. And do your tawaf and do your sa'i and do all your... But not before that. Meaning bring yourself down to Nothing. And the beautiful, beautiful purpose is that in there we find our izzat. We go from somebody who I, you know, I have to perform hajj to I get to perform hajj. It reminds me of a hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. It's a profound statement. Ya ilahi kafali izzan 
أن أكون لك عبدا وكفى بي فخرا أن تكون لي ربا That statement alone is incredible. It's enough of a respect for me. The Arabic used in the hadith is izzan, izzat. It's enough, it's kafa, it's kafi, it's enough that for me, that, that path of honor is what? That I am your abd Allah. And it's enough of pride for me, fakhar is used in Arabic, that you are my rabb. He takes something as low as ubudiyah. He takes something as low as subservience. Being a slave to a master is usually not something you're proud of. It's definitely not ba'is izzat inside the human being. It's not a source of pride for the human being. But here, Amir al is saying it's enough. Meaning what? I don't need respect from anybody else, from anyone else. I have my respect in my worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once that izzat is given, nobody can take that izzat away. So please hear one statement from my, one of my teachers in the Hawza. When we talked about this in Qum, we talked about Hajj. And we went through a whole semester on the manasik of Hajj inside of our fiqh istidlali class. And he stopped at one time, he talked about the idea that Hajj amounts to nothingness. And he says one thing, always remember, he says, when you choose to live a life of respect, then nobody can make you zalil in this world. When you choose to live a life of respect in this world, nobody in this world can take that respect away from you. But if you choose to live a life of disrespect, if you choose to be undignified, if you choose to have no self-respect in your life, don't expect others to respect you either. I mean, if you want to be aziz, live a life of izzat. You can't live a life of a zalil, I'm sorry to say, and expect to be aziz in the eyes of Allah or in the eyes of others. In the same token, you cannot live a life of being aziz and assume that someone else can make you zalil. It's not possible. The moment that you are respected in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no person can take that away from you. We're looking for respect in the wrong areas. We think that through my yelling and through my screaming and through my wilayat that I'm going to have respect of my wife and my kids. They should respect me because I'm their father. No doubt about that. The bare minimum respect you get, I get, is that I'm a father. Great. I helped to bring these kids in, in, into this world. But after that, if I want true respect, and true respect means if I pave a path towards Allah, they have so much confidence in me, they will follow me on that path towards Allah. That's the respect we want as men inside of our homes. Do we have that respect or not? And when we have that respect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't crave it. We don't need it from anybody else. And that comes inside the house from our behavior. Look at the story of Hudaybiyah. A guy, very, very simple, simple stories that you've heard. The treaty of Hudaybiyah is about to be written. Imam Ali is a scribe of that treaty, about to write that treaty down. And beside the name of our Prophet of Allah, he says, Rasulullah. The kuffar now read this and say, no, take this one portion out. We don't accept him to be the Rasul of Allah. And the Prophet of Allah now tells Imam Ali, you can just erase this part. And Imam Ali couldn't do it. I can't bring myself to erase this portion, Ya Rasulullah. I can't bring myself to do it. And so the Prophet does it himself. And then he has a very beautiful jumla, a statement to Imam Ali, a point for us men inside the home. We think that by shaking the walls and by instilling fear inside of our women, inside of our kids, we'll have respect and robe inside the house. The Prophet says, whether they write that or they don't write it, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am the Rasul of Allah. They can write it or erase it. That won't erase it in the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to find our respect through the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not through anything else. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And this is why it's important that we, we, we take a moment to reflect upon ourselves, to ask ourselves through the millions of distractions around you. 
Remember, I talked about the idea, if you're going to bring your kids from your respective countries, then what you're doing is you're presenting a buffet of lifestyles in front of them. And you're hoping they'll choose Islam as a lifestyle. They'll only choose Islam as a lifestyle when they are convinced that Islam is the only lifestyle. You were convinced by default in your respective countries. You could hear the adhan. You had a, you had a mosque in every neighborhood. Here it's not like that. You have to struggle really hard to convince your kids and, do, and, and be the best marketing agency to ensure that you've sold the fact to them that Islam is the right path. And we do that, I'm sorry to say, and you have to accept this now through behavior. Not just through rules, not through a title of being a father or a husband, through behavior. When they see you as the embodiment of the deen, then they'll follow you. And the Quran talks about this, right, in Surah An'am. It talks about the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you were somebody that was spiritually dead. We gave you life. And not only that, we gave you light as well. We gave you hayat, we gave you nur. We gave you life, we gave you light. That light wasn't just meant for you. Yamshi bihi fin nas. Walk with the people. That light. Walk with the people. With that light. Illuminate your path. Illuminate their path as well. Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. Allahumma salli ala. He has a discussion where he talks about the four types of hearts. I don't have time for all four. There are four types of hearts, he says. He talks about qalbi mankus, qalbi matbu, etc., etc. He talks about qalbi azhar. Azhar means lights. It's the, it's, it's the masculine of zahra. He says that qalb is the qalb of a mu'min. That heart is the heart of a believer where it has enough light to illuminate not only the darkness, uh, darkness of their own soul and their own heart, but enough also to shine the light on the hearts of others as well. I've given the example before, I'll give it one more time. Some of you in this, in, in this hall have joined us at Al-Mahdi for our camps we have every year. It's the, prime, it's the premier event of the summer for us. We spend... A year, two years planning, five days, four nights, four hours north, three ulama, it's a beautiful event. And the highlight every single day seems to be the campfire. That's when they pull out all their funky gadgets and their amazing flashlights and their amazing lights. There's always one or two kids that bachata have the worst flashlights of the entire camp. They can barely see the route in front of them. And one kid has enough light to light up the entire campsite. So now this, this kid comes and says, don't worry guys, put your flashlights away, I got this. And he lights his flashlight, it's enough now to have three, four, five, seven people walk with him. Put your flashlights away, my light is enough for all of you. The Quran says, take that nur, yamshi bihi fin nas, and start with your families. Start inside of your home. Those people that, you are, that are dependent on you, not just for rosy and food and clothing, but also for hidayat and ibadat. And if you want them to follow you on the path towards Allah, it's done through behavior. It's not done through you, you reminding them, I'm the man, the house, I'm the father. That's important. At the same time, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, please. And so it's important that we understand that we have to find not only our behavior in our worship, but our self-respect also in our worship. And understand that of all the various masters in this world, I've chosen in the month of Ramadan now, a difficult month to fast for that master. It's not that I have to worship Allah, I get to worship Allah. Now the entire now narrative changes. Now you find your respect in that. You believe that now you are chosen for this. It no longer becomes a burden. And slowly but surely now you convert, you, you, you convert your ana, your, your, your batin, into that ana that Allah is talking about. 
where all I see is myself in there. Now, how do we do that? The first thing that we have to realize is that when it comes to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be it the fast or be it the prayer or be it the hajj, we have two options essentially. We can focus on the physical dimension of that act of worship, the ruku, sujood, the physical up and down, the tawaf, the walking around the Kaaba, the going between the, the mountains, right, the, the, the shaving of the head, right, the hunger and the thirst of the month of Ramadan. And again, I go back to that book of Imam Khomeini's. He talks about the idea that worship absolutely has a physical form to it. If that physical form attaches only to your physical form, then when your physical being is buried in the ground, so will the worship as well. But if you have allowed that worship to penetrate your physical realm, engrave itself onto your heart, we can bury you in the cemetery and your essence and your ruh and your spirit will move forward, but that worship will come along with it. There's a hadith by our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salam. Now he talks about salat here, but really you can apply it to worship in general. He says, if salat is done at a level where the soul now prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that salat will manifest itself, personify itself on the day of judgment, in the akhirat. And actually speak to the angels and say, let Allah know. This is the salat now, Imam Sadiq. The salat now is talking. Let, the, let Allah know through the angels that this individual, so and so now, upheld my respect in that world. I want to uphold their respect in this world. That only happens when the Salat follows you to that next world. It's like the example that, you know, you buy, <laughs> those of you who have young kids, you buy a brand new furniture set inside of your, inside of your room, bedroom set. Dresser, a chester, a headboard, side tables, brand new. After many, many years now, you bought a brand new bedroom set. And the room looks amazing. What you, did, what you forgot was that you have small little kids who like to use markers everywhere they go. In their hand now, and if you're smart, you would, you would buy them washable markers. But no, people like me give my kids, mashallah, Sharpie markers, which are permanents. So now they're walking around my beautiful white bedroom set with a Sharpie in their hand. Not just one color, I'm mashallah smart, I buy 24 colors of the Sharpie. And in their hand are four Sharpies. If you try to scrub Sharpies out of, out of anything, it's almost impossible. I'm sure you'll send me solutions afterwards. But right now, this person now, three years old, is entering my room and he sees white canvases and white surfaces. And his eyes light up. It's Eid. I have a blue marker in my hand and I have all this white space to work with. What do I do? I mark up Baba and Mama's brand new bedroom set. Permanent marker. I can scrub and vinegar and the whole nine and Google it, whatever the case may be, it's there. Now, wherever I move, if I move to three homes and four homes and five homes somehow in this market, that bedroom set will come with me I'm hoping that the marker will stay in the old house and the bedroom set will come to the new house. But it won't. Where the bedroom set goes, the marker will go with it. Why? It's forever now on that bedroom set. We have to, we have to find a way to get, allow our worship to penetrate into us such that it is permanently written on our hearts. If that means a little bit of contemplation, if that means that maybe you lessen your load, if that means that you spend a little bit time for yourself, I think we're a little bit worried about seclusion, especially after COVID. COVID was a, bit, a little bit too much seclusion. But the idea of quietness, silencing the soul, as they say, quieting the nafs, as they say, 
finding a, a spot in your home to spend a little bit of time every day to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I get it, hustle, bustle, busy days of our lives is hard. But if you can do that after suhoor, after fajr, just before iftar, on, at night when the kids are asleep, find a moment where now you can contemplate to find out whether or not my fasting is etching, is, is engraving itself to my botan or not. Because what I want for all of you and for myself is that when I leave this world and my body is buried, I don't want my 60 years of worship, my 70 years of salat, my 50 years of, of fasting, my three hajjahs, all that khums I gave to be buried with my body. I'll end up entering the akhirat empty-handed. Sometimes I think we think that the grave is already made for us. It's waiting for us. Whatever we have in the hereafter is already in our grave. No, the grave is an empty box. It's an empty plot in the ground. You end up taking from this world whatever you want and you furnish that grave with whatever you bring to it. It's like walking into a brand new apartment or brand new home. It's empty. Whatever you decide, the sofa, the couches, the appliances, the TV, it's all up to you. Very, very frequently do you, uh, very infrequently, infrequently do, you, do, you, do, you, do you buy furnished apartments. Sometimes the grave is not furnished for us. It's empty. What we take from here will end up now furnishing that grave with us. My attempt for four nights with all of you has been very simple. We have to expect better from ourselves. It can't be that we continue to worship Allah and we continue to regress as human beings. And a human being's worth and value is sometimes calculated by their behavior with their closest ones. The Prophet says, the best of you are the ones who are the best with your women. That's the measuring stick. Whether or not Masumin respects you or not, whether or not people now endear you or not, the true test sometimes are the people inside of under your roof who see the good, the bad, and the ugly who see you without your mask, who see me without my mask. I enter that door, I have a mask on. I have certain libas on, but my wife sees me from my true essence at home. That's the true challenge. It's to now take that worship of Allah, find your izzat in that worship, and then use that behavior to ensure that you what? You establish your leadership inside your home such that whatever pave you, whatever path you pave towards Allah, they will follow you. Because what? They have yaqeen that not only does he believe, he also acts on his belief as well. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to accept our qaleel worship in the month of Ramadan, inshaAllah. We ask you, Allah, now we are one week in. Give us tawfiq now to do as much as we can as this month now is quickly leaving us, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, to forgive our sins and those of our parents. And finally, Allah, one dua we always have on this day of Friday, that we witness the zuhura of the imam of our time, inshallah, and that we are beside the imam when he comes. Thank you again. May Allah bless each and every one of you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.